G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy as we continue to exist in this post-2021 AFL season reality. With all of the trade period action having wrapped up and teams have acquired the players they want to acquire or lost the players that they didn't want to lose, the squads for next year are starting to take shape. Of course, we do have the upcoming draft in about a month's time, but until such time, we can still sort of reflect on the recent trade period and I guess the effect on each club's best 22 in that time. So in today's video, I'm going to put out a disclaimer. I haven't actually done any of the work to prep for it. I'm purely a going off an article from Fox Footy, so they deserve the credit. They have compiled each team's best 22, or at least as close to their best 22 as they can see. And they've put it all neatly together in an article based on, you know, the injuries each club has at the moment and also the trade acquisitions that each team brought in. It does make for a pretty interesting reading. And in today's video, I'm simply going to scroll through the list of each team's best 22 and just give a little bit of a, a snapshot, a bit of an impression. Don't have time to sort of go through each and every single player in each team and give a proper analysis but we can sort of formulate a general idea of how competitive each team is going to be this year and this is sort of a precursor to doing some 2022 ladder prediction content which I'm sure is going to be coming in the next few weeks. As always guys if you're new to the channel I invite you to hit subscribe for more you know AFL general content and in particular some draft content that we're going to be focusing on as we lead up to what I consider the final day of the season in late November when the drafts actually take place. But for now let's crack into it each team has been put ahead of us in this article and he's been sorted alphabetically. So we're going to start with the Adelaide Crows and then make our way through each team in the league. So on my screen, you can see Adelaide's best 22, or at least the Fox Footy's impression of what that will be. The changes in are Jordan Dawson, who was uh, one of the bigger headline recruits in this particular trade period. In terms of outs, they've got Tom Lynch, who left the club, and I think he's joining North Melbourne, if I'm not mistaken. David McKay, Tyson Stengel, Daniel Talia, and Jake Kelly. So in particular, a bit of impact on that back half of that team. Interestingly, unless I'm going crazy, I do not see Taylor Walker's name. So they've completely omitted him and then not even mentioned him in the description there. So it's interesting to see a little snapshot of what this Adelaide team will look like when he sails off into the sunset. If he plays another game, I'm not too sure. But they slapped Jordan Dawson on a wing, and that center line is Starting to look a little bit stronger with Ben Keyes having a breakout season last year and Seedsman being a consistently good player for them. Matt Crouch missed a lot of football for them, so it really comes in to bolster that midfield. So that midfield group is looking fairly strong. Maybe a little bit of vulnerability with their back line. I think Butts is an upcoming good solid player. I know they've got Fisher Mackesy in the in the ranks as well. Nick Murray and McPherson, again, are not players I know too much about. And I do wonder if maybe down the track, Adelaide look at maybe an Aaron Francis in the next year's trade period. The forward line also looks, you know, young and talented but not a whole heap of scoring power you got Schoenberg who is primarily a midfielder you've got McHenry who is kind of a pressured forward Tilthorpe Fogarty and McAdam are all pretty talented. Lockie Murphy goes all right, but I think that's probably one area they want to bolster in the upcoming drafts. So overall, I still think Adelaide will have another development year next year, and I don't see anything here that makes me think they're a real chance for the top eight, but I've been more wrong before. We'll move down to the Brisbane Lions. They had one in in this trade period, Darcy Fort and Grant Birchall and Archie Smith are both retired, if I'm not mistaken. That back six is incredibly strong with Gardner and Andrews as the main key backs. Stasevich, Adams, and Daniel Rich in particular own absolute guns. Ryan Leicester rounds out that back six and that is starting to look like a very mature and consistent team. They've got Cam Rayner back on the field, um, obviously returning from an ACL injury. It'll be a big one to watch for the Lions as they try and extract some improvement going forward. They've got a young list. Zach Bailey is also in that forward line. I think the mediums, your Rainers, your Baileys, your Lincoln McCarthy's, your Charlie Camerons, that's very, very dangerous. They've obviously taken out Eric Hipwood and the Lions are going to need to find a way to replace the goals that he kicks, but hopefully Rainer finds a way to impact in a similar fashion. Again, he's a very different player, but you know what I mean. Just sort of creates an opportunity for him to contribute in that forward line as he slowly recovers from that ACL. Carlton were considered one of the biggest winners of the trade period with uh, picking up Adam Chera and of course George Hewitt as well as a free agent. And you look at that midfield and it looks a little bit stronger. They've slapped Chera on a wing, although I think he's going to be primarily an on-baller for that footy club. Hewitt as well on ball as well. So that's suddenly starting to look like a slightly deeper midfield with Kerno as well. A lot will hinge on Paddy Cripps returning to his form, but if he does return to somewhat of the player that we remember... Cripps, Walsh, and Chera will be a dangerous front three supported by Hewitt and Kerno as well. So Carlton's starting to make a little bit of improvement in an area of weakness. Sam Doherty's obviously been left out as he goes through his unfortunate cancer battle, but I'm looking at that back six, and I actually think Carlton, on paper, have a fairly strong defensive unit there with Zach Williams and Adam Saad, maybe not finding their feet straight away in the team last year, but very, very talented players. Interestingly, they've got Lewis Young in their best 22, according to this as well. He's slapped on the interchange bench. I think they've 
left out Lockie Plowman as well. So it'd be a massive win for the Blues if they turn Lewis Young into a best 22 player. Next, we'll talk about the Pies. Again, another team with a very strong back six on paper. How Maynard, Crisp, and Quayno, they're very, very good medium players. And then Moore and Roughhead. Straight away, that back line really catches my eye. I think the midfield is probably, for once, looking a little bit weak for them. They got Dacos on a wing. The new recruit, Lipinski, who was traded for pick 43 from memory. They take up the wings, and the on-ball division is Pendlebury, Adams, and Dugowie. Dugowie showed a lot of progress as a midfielder sort of later in the season, so uh, he's one to watch as well. But with Pendlebury kind of slowing down, suddenly the Collingwood starting midfield isn't quite as hot, but they do have Nick Dacos, who they've slapped on the bench there as well, who will most likely play round one, you'd think, and probably play most of the season too. Once again, the forward line, probably a bit of a weakness for the Pies in particular in an absence of a key forward. Darcy Cameron and Majacek are both handy players, in particular the latter, but do something they need to target potentially in the draft if they manage to trade back into the top 20. Next, we'll talk about Essen, the surprise addition to the top eight in this past season. The ins include Jake Kelly, signed as a free agent from the Crows, and there's quite a few outs there, the most notable of which are Kale Hooker, Zaharakis, Mosquito. But overall, it's a young and up-and-coming side. They've put Jake Kelly into the starting 22. It's a good back six. I reckon Laverde showed some really good signs this year. Jordan Ridley's obviously, I think he was a best and fairest winner as well. Jake Kelly's an accomplished player. Probably still lacks a genuine key defender, but they did draft Zach Reed last year. So maybe with a bit of time, he can come in and find a spot in that team. The forward line's looking very dangerous with Jake Stringer and Tipper in there, crumbing to the likes of Harry Jones and Peter Wright. And of course, Archie Perkins as well has a lot of potential. And as we saw this year, that midfielder is looking pretty decent with Merritt, McGrath and Parrish of very formidable three, supported by someone like Dylan Shield as well. So plenty of reason to believe Essendon will be stronger again next year. Next, we got Fremantle, and it's so rare to see these teams sort of all laid out fully fit because that back six in particular is quite strong. Hamling and Pierce are very, very good defenders, but you never really see them play together too much. They've put Jordan Clark on a halfback flank for them. So I guess a Nathan Wilson is now deemed, uh, you know, all on the bench. He's on the bench in this particular team. Adam Chera was a huge blow for their best 22, both, you know, short term and long term. And you've got Sarong and Bray short in the guts there and they've put Mundy in the center line and I do hope for his own sake he doesn't have to play the entire season as a sentiment but don't forget they've also got Nat Fife in a forward flank there as well. They've squeezed Will Brody into their best 22 which is interesting kind of makes sense probably with uh, a bit of a lack of depth losing someone like an Adam Chera. Will Brody comes in Obviously not quite the same caliber of player, but as a big-bodied, mature midfielder, he will get a gig pretty early, you'd think. Next, we've got the Geelong Cats, and one change really for them. Jonathan Segler comes in and is picked as their starting ruckman as well. They had a few outs. Josh Jenkins has called it quits. Lockie Henderson as well. Nathan Kruger made his way to Collingwood. Darcy Fort left, Jordan Clark left, and Charlie Constable as well. So quite a big clean out of the sort of second and third tiers of that footy club. They didn't get the ruck situation completely right this year, and it's good for them to pick up a mature option who didn't really cost them a lot. So will it improve them massively? Maybe, maybe not. It's good at least that they've covered a weakness in their best 22. For anyone thinking Geelong's going to drop down the ladder next year, I just don't see it. Look how strong that team is, particularly that spine with Stewart and Blitzarves down the back and Cameron and Hawkins up forward. The Gold Coast Suns are an interesting one as a team that's been seemingly on the rise for a while. They've recruited a best 22 player in Mabio Chol, who will sort of support Jared Witts, who comes back into the side for this upcoming season. I think he adds a nice sort of different kind of foil in that forward line as well when he's not rucking to Ben King and Sam Day as well. And if things click, you know, Rankin and Sexton and Ainsworth as well are very, very talented small to medium forwards as well. So I do like the look of that forward line. The back line is talented as well with power how Ballard and Lacocious and Bose as well. Again, really strong medium players. I'm a big fan of Sam Collins, but long-term, they really do need to lock in a long-term key position defender, and that's why I think they might go for someone called Gibkiss in the draft this year. Gee, it would be nice to see Matty Rao play some consistent footy this year. Noah Anderson did pretty well in his absence, and we all know about Took Miller as well, but if Rao can get back to you know winning 25 possessions a game, gee, Gold Coast could be in for some improvement. Next, we've got the GWS Giants, and interestingly, they've left Toby Green in there. I mean, it makes sense. I think he's out for five of the first five weeks of the season. Interestingly, Bobby Hill has been picked in this best 22 as well, so you start to see why GWS weren't willing to give him up when they kind of wanted to add a small forward to their list anyway. 
They plonked Caniglio as the starting sentiment over someone like Tom Green. But regardless, that is a very, very strong center line with Josh Kelly, Caniglio, Perryman, as supported by Hopper and Ward on ball as well. And that defensive half back line in particular with Ash, Haynes, and Whitfield, Sam Taylor, and Isaac Cumming. I do genuinely think GWS probably have a top four best 22 and probably list as well. So if they can get their act together, they're a smoky for a flag, I reckon. Next up, we've got Hawthorne, who did try and offload a few best 22 players for some draft picks, and ultimately it didn't uh, come off. Off. They only brought in Max Lynch as a sort of long-term ruck option. I think the biggest ins for them this year in terms of certainly what I'm excited to see is James Sicily playing back in that back line. Denver Granger Barras as well. They've picked as a starting best 22. We know about CJ, but also Will Day on a wing as well. I think he's one of their brightest talents. It seems to me that the starting midfield is good and mature with Tom Mitchell, Warple, O'Meara. They're pretty solid players, but they will need some young midfield talent coming up soon. Not too much to say about the Melbourne Footy Club. We know how good this best 22 is. It comfortably the best team in the competition and I praise them for you know bringing in a Luke Dunstan type for relatively cheap replaces Nathan Jones as that big bodied midfielder outside the best 22 and this team didn't suffer too many injuries this year so it stands to reason why they would try and strengthen the depth so good business by the D's and it's fairly obvious to me that they will be a genuine premiership contender next season as well North Melbourne another up and coming team on the other end of the spectrum to Melbourne who we just talked about they brought in Callum Coleman Jones for a future second rounder and a few other things moving around and out they've got Garner Menadu, Dom Tyson, Will Walker, and Robbie Tarrant. So Robbie Tarrant, probably the biggest clear talent going out of the club, but obviously with the age profile, not a huge loss in the scheme of things. I think Coleman Jones is a big in in terms of what they needed. Uh, obviously someone to support Nick Larkin. They've got Jason Horn Francis starting on a half forward flank as well. So there's quite a bit of exciting young talent at North Melbourne now. Tarrant Thomas, I really enjoy. I really like Jaden Stevenson. Jai Simpkins, great to watch. And Luke Davies, Uniac as well, is what I feel like on the brink of breaking out. So I haven't even named them all, but for the first time in a while, I feel like North Melbourne are going to be a very, very exciting young team to watch going forward. Next up, we've got the Port Adelaide Power. Their ins included Jeremy Finn Layson as a medium forward or potentially a defender, I think people suggested, but he's been plonked on the bench here, which is kind of interesting because there was a bit of talk, at least by me, that there was a bit of a squeeze for that third tall, sort of medium tall option with Todd Marshall, Charlie Dixon, and Mitch Georgiatis in this team as well, but they've gone ahead and plonked him as the fourth bench spot. I don't know if they're kind of feeling a little bit lazy or if they simply see him as a defender. I'm not too sure. It does go down to suggest that Finlayson is in the side as ruck support as well, so perhaps that could work. A bit of experience leaving the side this year as well with Rockliffe and Hartlett leaving the club. Tyson Goldsack, I think everyone forgot, was on their list. The West Indian cricketer Joel Garner gets delisted as well as Peter Laddams moving to the Sydney Swans player that they clearly didn't need in terms of their best 22 long term so Port Adelaide have a very young and exciting list as well despite having some really quality senior players in guys like both that we talked about in particular they've also got you know the next generation coming through with Dersma, Butters, Connor Rosie, Bergman, Georgiatis it's it's a very very strong and well blended team. Next you got the Richmond Footy Club who uh, obviously had their dynasty sort of interrupted this year it remains to be seen whether or not they will come back in 2022 but it's a very very strong strong best 22 that was kind of decimated by injury this year and they've bolstered it with Robbie Tarrant back into the side I don't know why I said back I mean into the side but they've lost David Asprey Basha Hooley retired Nate was delisted Chol joined the Suns and Coleman Jones went to North Melbourne. If there's any Richmond fans out there who can illuminate me as to Noel Bolter's return date, is he likely to play round one? Because that would be an interesting consideration for them as well. But they do have Grimes and Vlostrin as well who can play a bit taller. So it's a very, very strong Richmond best 22. And the only thing that really makes them vulnerable is maybe some of their senior guys dropping off a cliff. But it's hard to predict that. I don't want to sound harsh, but the midfield though, in particular, it looks a little bit weak. You got Dion Prestia, who's probably an A grader on his day. I really like Jack Graham. Trent Cochin and Liam Baker, are they really really good on ballers. I think the midfield is looking very, very thin, and I'm not surprised Richmond was on the market for a midfielder in this trade period. But as we know, they're a system-based side, and when you've got guys like Dusty Martin in your team, you can exceed expectations based on the apparent talent on your list. So I'm not writing them off. I think they'll probably be a contender next year as well. Next, we're up to St Kilda, and uh, no ins in terms of the trade period. They're out solicited as Carlisle, Frawley, McKernan, Robertson, Claverino, Alabacus, and Luke Dunstan. So probably Carlisle maybe a little bit of a blow and Luke Dunstan as well fair to, played a fair bit of footy for them, but obviously not a required player. So overall, their best 22 is more or less preserved. A few players that were really good in their breakout year in 2020 kind of dipped, in particular a Dan Butler type. But the midfield's very sound, led by Jack Steele in particular, and they've got Hanbury on the best 22, but it'd be great to see him play some consistent footy because he's really struggled. 
Interestingly, they've recruited the Sydney Ruckman Callum Sinclair for their halfback flank. I think that means Jack Sinclair. It's gone for a fairly tall forward line as well, but you know, Rowan Marshall does obviously play in the ruck as well, and Membry is more of a third tall type as well. And when you got Butler and Higgins as well, you're not necessarily exposed at ground level either. So Kilda's a very hard one for me to peg. I don't know if I'm super optimistic about them bouncing straight back into the top eight, but there's a fair bit to work with in that best 22. Next, we'll move on to the Sydney Swans, who bounced into the top six to many people's surprise this year. They've brought in Pete to Laddams in terms of their best 22, but unfortunately did lose a few players, in particular Jordan Dawson and George Hewitt, who left to rival clubs. Not sure Hewitt is too much of a burn to their best 22, but I'm sure they would have loved to keep Jordan Dawson as evidenced by them offering him a five-year contract. But you just look at the young talent in this particular team. Haywood, Heaney, and Papley is a very dangerous forward line supported by Wicks. And then on top of that, you got Buddy Franklin as well. And Logan McDonald is one of the better young key forward talents in the competition, I believe. Tom McCartan is a very, very good key defender, although I think this is one area they'd like to bolster here with Lewis Millican named at centre-half back, and it starts to make sense why Sydney made a play for Tom Barras in this trade period. It's a funny best 22 with some very, very good veteran players in it, as well as some very, very good young players. Probably a slight lack in the 25 to 28 range, but that's all right. That just means there's plenty of improvement left ahead of the Sydney Swans. The penultimate team we're going to talk about is my West Coast Eagles. Looking at that team, uh, there's not too much I disagree with. Willie Rioli is a big in for us, I think. Not only for morale, and he's super exciting, but I actually think he's a really important part of the way we move the ball. And much was talked about Lewis Jetta exiting the club and losing his skills off half back, but Willie Rioli was very similarly skilled in the way that he moved the ball very aggressively. So I'm interested to see the effect he has when he's back into the team. Nothing too groundbreaking here. They have named Sam Petrevsky seeden in the best 22, and I do think he'll probably start there. Whether he stays there is another question. Obviously, the big question around West Coast is their young talent, and it's a shame because I think a few months ago, if you had asked me, I would have said some of the best young talents outside the Eagles' best 22 would be Dan Venables, Jared Cameron, and Jared Brander. Unfortunately, all have been cut now, so that just sucks. It does catch my eye now that they have left Bailey Williams outside our best 22, and I would certainly bring him in for Sam petrevsky Seaton as a second ruck support to Nick Nat Nui. I'd rather not have Oscar Allen do that again. But overall, still optimistic that the Eagles have the list profile here in a strong enough best 22 to challenge in September next year as well. Finally, we'll move up to the runner-up team from the 2021 AFL season. We're talking about the Western Bulldogs, and we know this is a very, very strong best 22. They've brought in Tim O'Brien as a bit of depth. Sounds like he's been recruited as a defender. There's a bit of speculation that he might be there also to support in the absence of Josh Bruce, who sadly doesn't make this team, although it does give a bit of an opportunity to Jamara Ugohagen to start more regularly in 2022. Lipinski leaving is probably not super ideal, but you look at you know a team like the Bulldogs, it's probably the single hardest midfield to break into into the competition right now. So you can understand why he would move seeking more opportunity and that the Dogs can get on pretty well just fine without him. Not too much analysis needed for the Western Bulldogs. We know how good they are and that is not too different a team that lined up for the 2021 Grand Final. So I certainly expect them to be contending for a flag again next season. That's it. There you have it, guys. That is a snapshot of every team's best 22 and my general thoughts on the ins and outs from last year. Let me know in the comments what caught your eye and, you know, maybe some big calls for the 2022 AFL season as well. I do intend to put a bit more thought into this and then also maybe make a ladder predictor for next year before too long. So until such time, hope you guys are doing well. Hope you're still enjoying the content and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.